Thomas and Heron, ladies and gentlemen, it's an absolute pleasure to welcome you to the 2017 Blau Lecture. Uh, on behalf of the Kaptein Institute, and with many thanks to Sudi Mikhenerala, who helped us put this on the last few years and have done a fantastic job, I want to thank them in advance for all the hard work that they've done. Actually, they've done a lot of hard work already, so uh, thanks very much to Sudi Mikhenerala. I'm going to introduce first, um, uh, sorry, I'm the director of the Kaptein Institute, Scott Traeger. I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. John McKean, who is uh, going to introduce our speaker tonight. So John, please take it away. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, members of the faculty, members of the board of Studium General, uh, welcome to the annual Blau Lecture, which this year will be given by Professor Anis Gaif from the University of Manchester. The Blau Lecture is given once per year by a distinguished scientist in the field of astronomy. It honors the memory of Professor Adrian Blau, who made an outstanding scientific and organizational achievements and had an extremely important impact on astronomy here in Groningen, the Netherlands and the world. Professor Blau was director of the Kaptein Astronomical Institute at the University of Groningen from 1957 to 1968, and then first the scientific and then general director of the European Southern Observatory from 1968 to 1975. From 1976 to 1979, Professor Blau was president of the International Astronomical Union. For his contributions to Dutch astronomy and to society, Blau was made a Knight in the Order of the Netherlands Line and a member of the Royal Dutch Academy of Sciences. He received many additional uh, honorary awards. He returned to the Captain Astronomical Institute after his retirement in 1981 and passed in 2010 at the age of 96. Unfortunately, due to ill health, members of the Blau family could not be with us tonight uh, as we honor his legacy. The Blau Chair and the Blau Lecture were initiated in 1997 as one of the six visiting professorships in the Faculty of Science and Engineering. Is select, um, the, the, Blau, the, Blau, sorry, the Blau Lecture is selected by the scientific staff of the Captain Astronomical Institute through the advice to the board of the faculty. Thus far, we have had the pleasure of welcoming 17 Blau professors at the University of Groningen, and it's my honor to introduce this year's Blau Chair Professor Ines Gauf, who will tell us about the complex structures of magnetic fields, both within our own galaxy and the universe as a whole, uh, during her lecture, which is entitled Dark Forces in the Invisible Universe. Uh, Professor Skiff is a world-renowned scientist in the field of radio astronomy, with an outstanding record in research and teaching that includes using radio astronomy to build knowledge-based societies in developing countries within Africa. She obtained her undergraduate degree at the University of Bristol in 2003 before being awarded her PhD from the University of Cambridge in 2007. For her thesis dissertation, Scaife worked as part of the Very Small Array Consortium, which aimed to detect the faint signals from the cosmic microwave background, where she focused on the so-called foreground contaminations in the form of spinning dust. This work continued as a fellow at the University of Cambridge as part of the Arc Minute Micro Kelvin Imager collaboration from 2007 to 2009. Professor Scaife then moved to the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies to work as part of the James Webb Space Telescope project, which will uh, overtake the Hubble Space Telescope in the next years, during which time from 2009 to 2011, she made her first visits to Groningen. In 2011, Professor Scaife held positions as a lecturer and then as a reader at the University of Southampton before moving to the University of Manchester in 2017, where she is currently head of the Interferometry Centre of, Excell Center of Excellence at the Jodrell Bank Centre for Astrophysics. Professor Scaife has been awarded numerous prizes and fellowships, which include the Isaac Newton Trust Teaching Fellowship in 2008 and a European Research Council Fellowship for Early Career Scientists in 2013. Uh, which funds her group's work investigating the origin and evolution of large-scale magnetic fields. In both 2014 and 2015, Professor Scaife was named as a World Economic Forum Young Scientist, one of 30 scientists under the age of 40 selected for their contributions to advancing the frontiers of science, engineering, or technology in areas of high societal impact. She has played a leading role in advancing the low 
frequency array here in the Netherlands and is developing new calibration algorithms for the next generation radio telescopes to be deployed in South Af Southern Africa and Australia. Professor Scaife has thus far published 114 refereed articles, including several prominent reviewer articles and letters to the editor of Science and Nature. These are particularly in the fields of spinning dust, young stellar objects, active galaxies, and magnetic fields, the latter of which is the subject of tonight's lecture, and I look forward to hearing. Thank you, John. Thank you, Scott. Um, I'm going to start on the podium. <laughs> um, I'd like to start by saying what a pleasure it is to be here um, in such a, a fantastic setting. And I'd like to thank the Captain Institute and the university for inviting me um, to give this lecture. It's an absolute honor for me. Um, as, as John said, I am a radio astronomer. Um, and most of what I'm going to talk about um, this evening is going to be radio astronomy. And I'm going to show you radio images predominantly. But I'd like to start by telling you a story about gamma ray astronomy. And gamma rays are the, sort of the, the astronomical opposite of the radio spectrum. They are the highest energy radiation that we use in astrophysics. And they have um, energies that are 100,000 times higher than visible light. And you only see them emerging from the most energetic objects in the universe. Now, being very high energy, they're not very good for us as people. Um, but fortunately, we don't experience gamma rays here on the surface of the Earth because the Earth's atmosphere absorbs them. So if you want to observe gamma rays as an astronomer, you have to build a satellite and you have to put it outside the Earth's atmosphere. This is the Fermi satellite, which is... Um, almost at the end of its 10-year mission as a gamma-ray observatory. Um, it sits in a low Earth orbit, about 300 kilometres above um, the surface of the Earth, and it's continuously collecting gamma rays. Now, to Fermi, the sky looks like this. This is the, the gamma-ray sky. This is an image of the whole sky. Now, the sky itself is a sphere, as we look up, um, and this is just a projection of that sphere. If we were to project the Earth in a similar way, we'd see a map that looked like this. What Fermi sees is our own galaxy cutting through the middle here. It's the brightest thing in the gamma ray sky. It's highly energetic. On the Earth here, we sit about two thirds of the way out from the center of our own galaxy. So as we look towards the center, which is right in the middle, we see the brightest emission. And as we look out towards the edges, we see just a little bit of emission because there's not so much material out there. Now, what Fermi sees are a variety of different astrophysical objects. As well as the galactic plane along the centre here, you can see that there are a bunch of bright spots, if you like, scattered around the sky and helpfully encircled in little white circles here. There's a whole bunch of different objects in here. The sun emits in gamma rays. Now, because of the motion of the Earth and the motion of the satellite, the Sun actually describes an arc in this image. I'm not sure if you can see the arc so well. But astronomical objects stay where they are. We have a bunch of stuff. Some of them are galactic, some of them are extragalactic. Um, within the galactic plane, we have supernova remnants, pulsars. This is a pulsar in our own galaxy in the galactic halo. Um, this is a globular cluster of stars down here. But as well as those objects, we also have a whole range of extragalactic objects, high energy astrophysical systems that live outside our own galaxy. And I'd particularly like you to focus just on this one down here. This object, along with all of these other objects, is a type of astrophysical system called a blazar. A blazar is a highly compact, supermassive black hole that is powering superluminal jets. And blazars, in particular, have their jets orientated almost directly towards the Earth. So they're extremely bright. And what we're seeing in gamma rays is not the black hole itself. Black holes don't emit any radiation. What we're seeing is the superheated material that's being sucked into the black hole. And that's producing the gamma ray emission. Now, 
Gamma rays are, as I said, extremely energetic um, radiation. And the gamma rays that are streaming through space from these blazars towards us, they're, they're so uh, energetic that they don't interact with a whole lot of stuff along the way. In fact, on average, a gamma ray photon will only interact every 240 million trillion kilometers in space. Now, it sounds like a big number. It is a big number. Um, to put it into context, that's about 3,000 times the length of our own galaxy. So a gamma ray photon will travel that distance on average before interacting with anything. Now, it's 3,000 times the length of our galaxy, but the universe is a big place. And so gamma ray photons do interact along the way. And typically, what they interact with is background starlight, the sort of general um, background in the infrared, the UV, and the optical that has photons buzzing around all over the universe that are just left over from star formation and the action of highly energetic objects. And when a gamma ray photon interacts with one of these background photons, it performs a process called pair production. The energies are combined and it produces two particles, a pair of an electron and a positron. This is um, a standard, a standard um, particle physics production mechanism for highly energetic particles. And this is a form of absorption for gamma ray photons. The gamma ray photon has gone. Doesn't happen to every gamma ray photon coming from a blazar, but it happens to a few of them along the way. Now the electrons that are produced, they're quite heavy compared to the photons themselves. So they don't travel anywhere near the same kinds of distances as the gamma ray photons do without interacting. In fact, they barely travel at all before they themselves interact again with the background starlight, the background photons. And when they do that, they helpfully produce another gamma ray photon. This is a process called inverse Compton scattering. It means that the, the electron or the positron interacts with the background photon and gives it an energy boost. It boosts it up to a slightly higher energy. And you end up with a sort of an exchange of energy between the two, um, between the photon and the particle. Now, what this means is that we still have some gamma ray photons coming out. And in fact, the Fermi satellite will see these as well. So for any source, any blazar in the sky, the radiation that comes off that blazar is a combination of the original gamma rays and then some extra gamma rays that have been produced by the inverse Compton process. And they have different spectra, but because the electrons don't move so much, they come from basically the same area of the sky. So they, they look as though they're coming from the same source. That is, unless something causes the electrons to move, the electrons and positrons. And the thing that can cause charged particles to move are magnetic fields. Now, if the electrons and positrons are embedded in magnetic fields, those magnetic fields exert a force upon them and cause them to move around. They cause them to diffuse um, over larger distances. And what that means is that when Fermi looks at a blazar, it could potentially not just see a centrally concentrated source of gamma rays, it could also see a halo around that source. And there's then a separation of the photons. The pair production, the photo, gamma ray photons that are going into pair production come from the center of the source, and the inverse Compton produced photons come from the halo, in principle. Now, in practice, Fermi doesn't see these halos. But it does see that there's a loss of photons from the blazars themselves. So they know that the photons are being um, converted into inverse Compton photons by pair production and inverse Compton scatterings. But it can't <coughs> see the halo radiation. And the reason for that is that it's too faint. It's below the detection threshold of the Fermi satellite. And that's because it's been diffused out so far that the radiation isn't concentrated enough to detect. 
And that tells us about the magnetic fields. It tells us that there needs to be a sufficient magnetic field present to move the electrons away far enough. So the question is, what are the magnetic fields that are causing the electrons to move? Well, as I said, gamma ray photons travel a long way without interacting with anything. So it needs to be a pretty big thing that's causing them to move. A single galaxy is 3,000 times too small to have an interaction generally. But fortunately, the universe is full of structure. And we call that structure the cosmic web because when we look out at the pattern of galaxies on the sky, they're not completely randomly distributed. They follow distinct shapes. And those shapes show us something that looks like a spider's web. We see filaments, and we see sheets, and we see empty spaces that we call voids. Now, for a gamma ray photon traveling its 240 million trillion kilometers, most of what it's going to see are voids, because voids, the empty spaces, make up most of the universe. And so the magnetic fields that are causing the halo around blazars statistically are due to the voids. So that scattering is telling us about the magnetic field strength in the void. Now, as I said, Fermi can't see the halo. It can only put a detection limit on it, which means that it can't measure the magnetic fields exactly. It can only put a limit on how big they might be. And that limit looks like this. In this diagram, what I'm showing you is a distribution of values. In this dimension, we have the size of the magnetic field. And in this dimension, the strength of the magnetic field. The Fermi limit is telling us that the magnetic fields have to be bigger than some value in order to diffuse the halo out to a sufficient degree that it's not detectable. So it's a, a lower limit. It tells us the fields have to be bigger than some value. Now, the exact um, number that we can put on that value actually depends also on how big the fields are. So the limit changes depending on how big we assume the magnetic fields are. And we don't know exactly what their size is, which is why we have a range here. And the Fermi limit tells us that for smaller um, fields lengthwise, we can have a larger magnitude for the magnetic field strength. But for larger fields, we can have a smaller value. And the actual values in this plot, you don't need to be able to read the numbers on the axes. The most exciting thing about this result is not the numbers that they got, but the fact that they got a number. The take-home message is that the magnetic field strength in those empty regions of the universe is not zero. That's the exciting result. It's a simple result, um, but it's a very exciting result. And you may be saying, why? <laughs> why do I care? Why do I care what, what value the magnetic fields have in voids? You know, I, voids are the last thing on my list. Um, but voids are important. And the reason they're important is because voids can tell us where magnetic fields came from in the first place. So, enough of gamma ray astronomy. I'm going to skip forward to some radio astronomy and talk about the universe in general. And we'll come back to why the voids are important. When we look around the universe, and this is just a nice picture of the universe. This is the, the Whirlpool Galaxy M51. This is an image from the LOHAR telescope. What we see around us are structures of galaxies and radio galaxies, clusters of galaxies, and star formation and planet formation, and um, massively dynamical processes happening all over the universe. And the one thing that we need for all of those processes is magnetic fields. Magnetic fields are completely ubiquitous in the universe. They control how galaxies evolve. They're crucial for star formation. 
they stretch across vast swathes of space in galaxy clusters, and we see them in their radio emission. So we know that magnetic fields are absolutely crucial. All of the radio emission you can see in this image, every spark of light, depends on there being magnetic fields. And it depends on there being magnetic fields there that are actually quite strong in astrophysical terms, not in on Earth magnetic field terms, but in astrophysical terms, really quite strong. So the fields in a galaxy like M51 have um, a strength of about 10 micro gauss at the center of the galaxy, and that's a big number for astrophysical magnetic fields. And we can not only measure how strong they are in galaxies, we can also see the pattern of the magnetic fields. This is a, an image of another galaxy. This is NGC 628. Um, it doesn't have a nice um, name <coughs> as well. But this is a, like M51, this is a star-forming galaxy like our own Milky Way. So it has a similar level of magnetic field strength in the centre. It has a field strength of about 10 microgauss. And the nice thing about this image is that you can see these sort of brush stroke lines. Those are showing you the direction of the magnetic field in this galaxy. And what you can see is that the magnetic fields follow the direction of the spiral arms. They're not perfectly overlaid on the spiral arms, but they follow the same sweeping structure. So we can see that the magnetic fields are there, we can see that they're quite strong, and we can see that they have directions that are um, comparable to the starlight that we see from these galaxies. But we don't know where they came from. For a galaxy to have magnetic fields that are this strong, and, and for galaxies like this, magnetic fields are crucial for how they are formed, there needed to be something there in the first place. There needed to be something that we call a seed field, a sort of something that we could grow our galaxy from. And we don't know where those seed fields came from. And that's why the voids are so important, because the voids can tell us where those fields came from. So to go back to the question... <laughs> Where do magnetic fields come from? What we're asking is, where did the seed fields come from? Where did those original um, seeds that sourced the growth of galaxies that growed, grew into the structures around us, and literally around us in the Milky Way today, come from? And it's not that we have no idea. We have options. They could have been produced very early in the universe. They could have been produced by quantum transitions and then amplified up as the whole structure of the universe around us grew during innovation and afterwards. And those are called early type seed fields. They're of cosmological origin. The other option is that maybe they were produced by the first galaxies. When you have ionized matter moving in temperature gradients, you can produce very small magnetic fields. And so maybe when the first galaxies formed under gravity, we started to get the first seed fields being produced. And these are called astrophysically produced seed fields, late type, because they happened later in the universe. Now, the key differentiator between these options is how much magnetic field you have in the spaces between galaxies. If the magnetic fields were produced very early in the universe, and then grew as the universe expanded, you would expect to find magnetic fields everywhere, even in voids. If the magnetic fields were produced in galaxies themselves, then you'd expect them to be much more concentrated around those structures. And so you'd expect to see almost no magnetic field within the voids. And that's why, to answer the question, of whether the seed fields were cosmological or astrophysical, we need to know what the magnetic fields in voids look like. So this is why the Fermi result was so exciting, because it didn't say that there were zero magnetic fields. If Fermi had said there's zero magnetic field in voids, that would have been it, astrophysical, late type. But it didn't say there was zero. It said they're greater than some value. And that value was not quite high enough for us to be able to differentiate between the two mechanisms. So, 
we need a new experiment. We need something that allows us to measure what the magnetic field strength is in the voids. Now, magnetic fields, like black holes, don't produce any radiation directly. They are invisible, if you like. And astrophysically speaking, there are two ways of being invisible. The first is simply that the object isn't producing radiation in a wavelength range that you can detect. So radio is a very nice example of this. Before we had radio telescopes, the radio universe was invisible to us. But by building a new kind of detector, we can now see it. The second option is that they just don't produce radiation at all. And that's a bit more difficult. It's not simply a question of building a new type of telescope. But fortunately, astronomers are quite good at seeing invisible things. So to give an example of this, this is a little video um, of stars. And these images were taken over 16 years, first with the uh, new technology telescope, the NTT, in La Silla in Chile, and then with the very large telescope both of which are instruments operated by the European Southern Observatory. So if you like, they are part of Professor Blau's legacy. Now, the interesting thing in these images is not the stars that you can see. It's the thing that you can't see. It's the thing that's causing the stars to move in this way. And the most important thing about these data was, in fact, this star. Because in 16 years, you get a whole loop in this star. And that tells you pretty much what you're looking at. Because the stars in this image are orbiting something. And this is a simulation to show those orbits. And they're orbiting a thing that we can't see in these data. And of course, the thing we can't see is the black hole at the center of the galaxy. The black hole is exerting a force on the stars at the center of the galaxy and causing them to orbit around it. So even though the black hole is invisible to us, we can still see the effect that it has on other things. Now, Sagittarius A star, the black hole at the center of our galaxy, is about 30 times larger than our sun in physical size, but it's about 4 million times more massive. Very highly massive object. And so it exerts a strong gravitational force on the objects around it. And that gravitational force is what's causing the stars to move in their orbits. For a star that you know, is sort of wandering along, doing its own thing in this direction, it will feel a force towards the black hole, which will then cause it to move in an elliptical orbit towards the black hole. Now, Magnetic fields do a very similar thing. But instead of mass, magnetic fields exert a force on charged particles. And in a completely analogous way, a magnetic field will exert a force towards itself on an electron, which is moving along and doing its own thing, and causing the electron to start moving in an orbital path. So we can look for these effects caused by magnetic fields. And of course, a lot of radio astronomy is based on this very effect. Because if the electrons are moving fast enough, when they're accelerated by a magnetic field, they'll start to move in a helical um, path around the magnetic field lines. And for electrons that are moving close to the speed of light, so very, very fast, we call them cosmic ray electrons, they'll produce radiation. And that radiation is the synchrotron radiation that formed the basis of practically every object that I showed you in that LOFAR image earlier. And what that means is that if we look up at the sky, and this is an optical image of the sky, again, you can see the galactic plane across the center here. In the optical, we can't see the center of the galactic plane because the dust absorbs the starlight 
So it completely obscures the light that's coming from the center of the galaxy. But the galaxy is not only full of starlight, it's also full of stellar explosions and highly energetic processes. And those processes accelerate electrons to speeds close to the speed of light. So we have lots of cosmic ray electrons in our own galaxy. And as I said before, we have lots of magnetic fields. We have micro-Gauss fields. And so if we look at the galactic plane in the radio, it looks like this. It's extremely bright, and we see the synchrotron radi uh, radiation at radio wavelengths. If we zoom in, again, we can see the pattern of magnetic fields, because the synchrotron radiation is produced by the magnetic fields, and the polarization of the radio light tells us the direction of the magnetic fields. Because we're embedded in the galaxy, once again, just to give you an idea of where we are, we're about two-thirds of the way out. What we see when we look at the small-scale structure of our own galaxy oops, is a sort of turbulent gas. And that's a turbulent gas full of those cosmic ray electrons and magnetic fields. And we see, a sort of a, a, again, a turbulent pattern of directions in the magnetic fields, because we're embedded inside the galaxy itself. If we could look at our own galaxy from the outside, it would look a lot like NGC 628. We would see these coherent magnetic fields sweeping round in similar directions to the spiral arms in the galaxy. So, Magnetic fields produce synchrotron radiation. So perhaps we should just go and look in voids for synchrotron radiation. And we could use that to measure the magnetic field strengths in exactly the same way that we do for galaxies. Now, the one slight problem with that is that what we see in the radio is not the same structure of the cosmic web that we know is there from looking at the pattern of galaxies. What we see in the radio is simply the galaxies themselves. So in this LOFAR image, we have M51 at the center of the image, very bright and spirally. But most of the other stuff that we see in the image are just these little compact sources. And again, these are other galaxies. They're not necessarily star-forming spiral galaxies like M51. They could be radio galaxies with black holes and jets. But they are galaxies. They're compact objects relatively in the universe. And what that means in our picture of the cosmic web is that we're not seeing the large scale structure. What we're seeing are the little over densities where the galaxies are. And the reason for that is that that's where the cosmic ray electrons are. Outside the galaxies, for most of the universe, there's nothing to accelerate ele electrons up to speeds close to the speed of light. They simply aren't there. And if you don't have cosmic ray electrons, then you don't have synchrotron radiation. So we can't use synchrotron radiation to look for the magnetic field strength in voids. We need to find a different way. And the key to that method is, in fact, these little galaxies. Because although they're not telling us about the voids themselves, some of them sit behind the voids, and we can look at the effect that the voids have. Because wherever you are in the universe, if you produce radiation, it has to pass through the rest of the structure. So for our little radio galaxies sitting megaparsecs away from us on the Earth, we see their radiation with our telescopes. I've randomly selected a radio telescope here, for the radio <laughs> astronomers. Um, but when we observe it, it's had to travel all the way through the intervening structure to get to our telescope. And although radio waves don't interact in the same way as gamma ray photons, they have very low energies as opposed to the high energy gamma ray photon, that doesn't mean that nothing happens to them. 
And so along the way, our radio waves are going to be affected by the cosmic web. And specifically, the effect that I'd like to talk about is how the cosmic web changes the polarization of our radio emission. Now, for a radio wave, like any other electromagnetic wave, the polarization is defined by the electric field direction. An electromagnetic wave is a coupled electric and magnetic field. And the propagating electric field has a preferential direction. Here you can see that the vector is sweeping out this line in the plane at the end. And this is what we call a linear, a linearly polarized wave because it traces out just a line. So this is a linearly polarized electromagnetic wave. In practice, that direction could be at any orientation. What we tend to do is we define a plane in which to measure the angle of that orientation relative to two orthogonal axes, and we decompose our wave into orthogonal components. If they are, so orthogonal means at 90 degrees, so the corner of a square. If those components have equal amplitude, then we'll get a 45 degree polarization angle. If we want to change that polarization angle, all we have to do is alter the amplitude of one of the components. The key to linear polarization is that the two components have to be in phase with each other. And that means that whatever their relative amplitudes are, they have to arrive at the same time. Peaks have to arrive at the same time, and troughs have to arrive at the same time. And in that case, we just get a nice linear polarization. Now, this polarization is characteristic property of an electromagnetic wave. For synchrotron radiation that's produced by our cosmic ray electrons, the polarization angle is telling us about the orientation of the magnetic field that produced it in the first place. So it's telling us about the structure of the object producing the radiation. If we look back at our galaxies, we can see that in our pictures. So in, in, in modern pictures of radio polarization, we tend to display it as this sort of feathered effect, showing the, the brush strokes showing the magnetic field direction. But perhaps it's easier to understand by looking at an older image. So this is, again, this is M51, the Whirlpool um, galaxy. And what you can see here are these little lines all over the image. And these lines are showing the magnetic field direction. The magnetic field direction is taken from the polarization angle of the arriving synchrotron radiation. You can see that the angle changes at different places in the galaxy. And that's because the magnetic fields are changing. They're changing their direction to follow the spiral structure of the galaxy. The angle is simply the orientation of the electric field vector in the synchrotron radiation. Now, when the synchrotron radiation passes through the cosmic web, this is the property that gets affected. And the reason that it can be affected is because of the way that we can decompose our polarization. For a linear polarization here, this is our linear polarization direction, we've decomposed it into an X and a Y component, two waves arriving in phase, peak and peak, trough and trough, and giving it polarization. If instead of having them arrive in phase, we had them arrive out of phase, so here, peak to trough, peak to trough and trough to peak, what would happen is that the sum of those vectors would describe a circle as a function of time. And the direction of motion depends on which one is arriving first, the red one or the green one. If we switch them round, the circle would go the other way. 
And we call those two directions left-handed and right-handed circular polarization. Now, the key to this is the fact that even though our outcome is circular, we've created it by taking the sum of two linear electric fields, so two linear, um, linearly polarized um, sources of radiation. So circular polarization is the sum of two linear waves. And if we can say that circular polarization is the sum of two linear waves, then we can turn that statement around and say that linear polarization is the sum of two circular waves. So we would add together left and right to get a linear polarization. And this is the key to how the cosmic web affects radio emission. If we have one of our blazars or a radio galaxy or any other polarized radio source, where we have synchrotron emission coming off it, and we know that synchrotron is characteristically linearly polarized, so it has some polarization angle, we can decompose that linear polarization into a right-handed circular polarization and a left-handed circular polarization. And we could add them back together and get back the linear polarization that we'd, we'd started with. And that's all fine, unless we make them pass through a medium that changes one of those two circular polarizations. Now, although there aren't cosmic ray electrons everywhere in the universe, the one thing that there typically is, is low energy ionized gas, so low energy electrons, electrons that aren't moving close to the speed of light. They tend to be pretty much everywhere in the universe because hydrogen and ionized hydrogen is so prolific. And ionized gas is a bit of a problem for circularly polarized radiation, especially if that ionized gas also has a magnetic field running through it. If we have a magnetic field in this direction, the direction of propagation, then it's going to be exerting a force on all of the electrons in the gas and causing them to move in those helical orbits. Now, some of them are going to be moving in the same sense as the right-handed circular polarization, and some of them are going to be moving in the same sense as the left-hand circular polarization. The difference will be the direction of the magnetic field. So if the magnetic field is, say, all in this direction, then all of the electrons will be moving preferentially in a clockwise direction, which means that they'll be moving in the same set as the right-hand circular polarization, which is going, the vector is going round like this. And the effect of that is that the ionized gas interacts differently with the right-handed circularly polarized light than it does with the left-hand circularly polarized light. And the effect is that, well, so in this case, the right-hand polarization travels more slowly through the ionized medium. So when the waves come out at the other side, there's a slight delay between them. And so when we recombine them to form a linearly polarized wave, we still get back a linearly polarized wave, but it has a different polarization angle. And so the effect of radiation passing through our ionized gas is that it's rotated the polarization angle of the incident radiation, and this is called Faraday rotation. What that means for our astrophysical radio sources is exactly the same thing will happen as their radiation passes through the cosmic web. For a background source that's producing some synchrotron radiation with a particular polarization angle, as it travels through the magnetic fields in the cosmic web, which are surrounded by that low temperature ionized gas, its polarization angle will be rotated. And the direction of rotation depends on whether the fields are pointing towards the telescope or away from the telescope. And it will vary because the magnetic fields change 
across the whole structure of the cosmic web. But even a very small amount of magnetic field can cause a rotation in polarization angle. So even in the voids where the magnetic fields are very, very small, it's possible to see this effect, or in principle, it's possible to see this effect. So what does that mean about our view of the sky? Well, if we go back to that optical picture of the sky, again with the galactic plane through the centre, if we look at every polarised radio source in this image, we can try and measure its Faraday rotation. And this is what the sky looks like if we do that. So the blue and the red objects are all polarised radio sources. And the colour depends on whether the magnetic field is pointing towards us or pointing away from us. And you probably can't see it, but the circles also have different sizes, which tells us the, the magnitude of the effect. And you can see that there's, there's some distinct structure here. We can see up here that there's a whole patch of um, red sources, which means that the magnetic field strength over here is all in the same direction. The same thing is happening down here with all the blue sources. So we have a sort of a, a flip in the sign of the magnetic field. Um, we have a big hole here because this is just the northern hemisphere. We're missing the southern sky. Um, but you can still see the patterns in the sources. And in this image, there are 37,000 radio sources. It's about one source per square degree on the, on the sky. So the moon on the sky is about half a degree across. So you'd need four moons, one polarised source per four moons. So are those patterns we're seeing just produced by the cosmic web of large-scale structure. Is that it? Like, have we done it? That's, we've, we've found all of the patterns from all of the, the web. We can see the filaments, the voids, the sheets. Um, and unfortunately, the answer is no. Because although the emission from our blazar or our other polarised source is passing through the cosmic web on its way to our radio telescope, it's quite likely that there's some other stuff along the way as well could be some galaxies. It's probably not a massive effect. The volume filling factor of galaxies along the line of sight is going to be very small, so we can, we can probably average out over those effects. A slightly bigger problem is going to be our own galaxy. We sit within our own galaxy. We sit two-thirds of the way out in our own galaxy. If we look in any direction, the first thing we will see is our galaxy. And in any direction, the radiation arriving at the Earth, has to travel through our own galaxy. And our own galaxy is full of magnetic fields. And it's full of electrons, and it's going to produce its own Faraday rotation. The final thing we have to cope with is the Earth's ionosphere, that pesky atmosphere that's stopping the gamma rays from killing us all. It's also got a lot of electrons. It's also got a quite a strong magnetic field. So we'll also see Faraday rotation caused by our own ionosphere. Now, in fact, when we look at those 37,000 sources on the sky, what we're seeing is mainly our own galaxy. All the structures that we see in that image oops, are due to our own galaxy. And, and mostly what we're seeing is not the small-scale turbulent structure that I showed you earlier. It's it's a component of the galactic ecosystem that we call the violent ISM, the violent interstellar medium. So we, we have all kinds of names for the different gas components of the, the galaxy. There's the, the, the cold interstellar medium, the warm interstellar medium, the hot interstellar medium, the slightly warm, hot interstellar medium. Um, but the bit that relates to the close formation and destruction of stars, that's the violent interstellar medium. And in its simplest picture, it looks like bubbles. 
bubbles of ionized gas, bubbles of magnetic fields, bubbles of cosmic ray electrons. There's some cartoons that show you these bubbles. This is from the, uh, a paper in 1977 that actually coined the phrase violent ISM. But just to show you that this is actually what we see as well, this is a radio image of the Cygnus X region. This is the brightest radio region in our own galaxy. This is from the, the Canadian Galactic Plane Survey. And it shows you there's a supernova remnant over here. This is the Gamma Cygni supernova remnant. These bubbles are H2 regions. Those are bubbles of hot gas that are forming stars and are full of stars. Um, but our, our galaxy is basically bubbles. And everywhere we look through the galaxy, in terms of the rotation measure sky, that's what we see. We see the structure of our own galaxy. Now, the key to being able to separate that structure from the structure of the cosmic web, which is what we really want to know about, we want to know about the voids, is being able to sample it well enough. So we need more polarized radio sources. We need to have more than one source per square degree. We need to be able to get a higher resolution picture, if you like. So if we need more radio sources, the limitation at the moment is how faint the objects we can see on the sky are. If we could see fainter objects, we would see more objects. So we need a more sensitive telescope. And in the radio, sensitivity basically equates to collecting area. The more area your telescope has for collecting radio waves, the more sensitive your telescope is. So if we need more radio sources, we need a bigger telescope. Unfortunately, we're building one. Um, so the square kilometre array, which is what I spend a lot of my time on these days, is the next generation of radio astronomy. And it's a telescope that's so big that it's, it's split not only across countries, but also across continents. Now, for polarised radio sources, like the ones in the image that I showed you, the components of the telescope that we need to use is located in South Africa, and specifically in the, the Karoo Desert, which is a protected astronomy reserve in South Africa. And it looks quite similar to other radio telescopes. There's just more of it. For the Square Kilometre Array Phase 1, there will be 197 dishes on the ground in South Africa. And they will spread across Southern Africa into other um, countries. Um, in phase two, there will be 3,000 dishes, is the plan, and they'll stretch right across the Mozambique Channel, across Madagascar and out to Mauritius. But for the moment, we'll settle for the 197. Now, with 197 dishes, you can really start to fill in the resolution of the sky. Um, as I said, currently in this image, we have about one polarised radio source per square degree. With the SKA, we should get 1,000 polarised radio sources per square degree. So that really starts to fill in the detail. It's not the end of the question because we still need to work to get rid of that <coughs> galactic contribution. But with that kind of resolution, we've got a much better chance of doing it. And I showed you an artist's impression of the SKA. It's due to be completed, the construction, in 2024. But that doesn't mean that there's nothing on the ground. So this is, um, this is not an artist's impression. This is a photograph of um, one of the Meerkat telescope dishes. And, um, the sky in the Southern Hemisphere is much more vivid than it is in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, the plan is to have 64 dishes in the Meerkat telescope, which will then form the first component of the 197 dishes of SKA Phase 1. The plan is to have 32, I think, by the end of this year. There are already almost that many on the ground. I'm just showing you the one because this is a nice picture. And that's all I wanted to tell you about today, is really why we're doing what we're doing and how we're going to do it in the future. 
And so the take-home messages are really that different parts of the universe can be invisible in different ways. And so we have to think of clever ways of understanding them. And in fact, observing the effect that something has can be as important as observing the thing itself. Um, and very importantly, magnetic fields affect everything. You can't escape from them. Um, but if we want to know where they came from in the first place, then we need more radio sources because we need to be able to separate out the galactic contribution. And that's where I'll finish. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna, for your, your lecture. Um, we, have a, we have some time for questions from the audience. Is there anyone who would like to ask a question? Oh, we have, well, if you wait one moment, we have a microphone. You, you tell us repeatedly that the magnetic fields are important for the, basically the structure forming in the universe. But what would be actually the difference? Because if you simulate it, you do find the structure that we actually observe the, without the magnetic fields, I mean. So what, what is the effect of the magnetic fields that you are looking for? So the, the effects of magnetic fields, well, all kinds of things. So magnetic fields are never the dominant factor in structure formation. Gravity is always dominant. Um, but for example, so a nice example is star formation. So in order to form stars through gravitational collapse, you need to be able to conserve angular momentum. And without magnetic fields threading through star, for star formation regions, you can't conserve angular momentum. So stars wouldn't form, would be the first point. Would there not be stars formed without the magnetic field? So you would probably get, um, so you would get the very first kind of stars, which are very different to the ones that we see today. So the very earliest type stars, I think they're called um, population three stars, would probably still start to form under gravitational collapse. And in fact, they would form their own magnetic fields as well. So they are, a, um, they are proposed as one of the possible astrophysical mechanisms for forming magnetic fields. There are reasons why... Um, you can't expand that model to entire galaxies. But you would get population three stars which are very massive, very short-lived, composed almost entirely of hydrogen and helium, but you wouldn't get stars like our sun. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Do you have another question? So how do you know the intrinsic polarization angle of all your sources so that you can measure the rotation? So, so, in fact, we don't need to, so we don't, is, is the answer. The way that we do it with the looking at all the sources is we actually look at them statistically and look at the correlations between the, the, the um, rotation in, in local areas. So, yes, you, you can't know the intrinsic polarisation. If void exerts magnetic field, can it be truly called a void? <laughs> it's, it's like if a void falls in the forest and there's no one there to hear it. Is it? <laughs> um, I, think, I think it's true to say that there is no area of the universe that is completely devoid of anything. So it's, it's, it's more of a void than other areas. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, yeah. Yeah, thank you for your talk. Uh, I find it's actually quite hard to follow. Uh, so maybe I'm asking a quite silly question. Uh, you mentioned there were uh, 37,000 radio uh, sources in your image. Mm -hmm. And I wonder how actually how far they are from us. Are they farther from each other or they are of a similar distance to us? So they are at a range of distances. And in fact, we don't know the distance to all of them. In order to know how far away an astrophysical source is from us, we need to be able to measure 
um, its velocity away from us, which we do using um, optical spectra. And doing that is quite difficult, especially for the most distant sources. Um, and so when we see a map of sources on the sky, we, we generally don't know how far all of them are from us. Um, we um, will probably know a large fraction of them from optical surveys. Um, but in answer to your question, the sources in the image will be distributed at different distances away from us. And so they will see different amounts of the cosmic web um, as their light travels towards us. Um, is there another? Yeah, I, sorry, I can't see. Yeah. yeah, thank you for your talk. Um, it's also a bit difficult for me, but um, I have a question about um, how are the telescopes able to see very um, like galaxies very far away? I mean, I can imagine that there are like millions and millions of galaxies and how can astronomers say, well, there is a galaxy in so, so far away. Why is that able to see if you explain that there is so much background energy and magnetic fields which can um, mingle up so why can yeah. you say that? So, so your question is if there's so much stuff in between us and the galaxies how can we see them and and the answer is that we can't always so for it depends on what wavelength we're looking at so for example if we were looking at a lot of the galaxy these galaxies in the optical they might be um Firstly, so far away that we didn't have the sensitivity to see them. Or for optical light, they might be, it might be absorbed by our own galaxy. It might be obscured. So sometimes we can't see them. Radio waves have such low energy and such large wavelengths that they tend not to be absorbed by um, low density material in the cosmic web along the line of sight. That's not to say that they're never absorbed. And there are certain um, chemical um, elements in the universe that do absorb them. Um, but the answer is that we can't see everything. Um, and what we do see, we work very hard um, comparing it to simulations to understand which bits we're missing. So to understand the, the observational selection effects that, that happen to our data. Was there a question? One in the back? And yes, yes, that's fine. A practical uh, question. Halfway in the talk, we saw this um, <coughs> planet uh, rotating in 16 years around a black hole. I was surprised by that, but where does it uh, come from, the, the, the film? The, the star, so um, yes, so it's a star, not a planet. Um, and the star. Is sorry, yeah, of course. Yeah, sorry. The star is called S2. Um, it's in our own galaxy, and it's an optical image. The one that I showed you is cleaned up, um, so you don't see all the noise. But it's literally a time lapse of image, optical images that show the changing position of the stars. And I think, actually, maybe I can probably skip back to it if this goes quickly enough. Um, you can see the date incrementing. Oops, there we go. Yeah, so you can see the date up here. So for every new snapshot image, it's incrementing that date. And the, all of the dates up to 2002 were taken with one telescope. And all of the data after 2002 was taken with a different telescope. But because it's optical light, we're just adding the images together to form a time-lapse video. We had a question in the front, yeah. Um, thank you for your fascinating talk. Um, no, I have nothing to do with this field, so I don't know what my questions are. But I had a couple of questions. The first one is, um, when you say that you want to detect the rotation in the angle, yeah. actually, how do you know that it has actually rotated? Uh, that's my ah, first. Yes, so, yes. Um, so I should have said this, actually. I apologize. The amount of rotation that we see depends on the frequency that we're observing at. And typically, with a modern radio telescope, we'll observe over a range of frequencies. And so we see a slightly different amount of rotation in each frequency channel. And that allows us to, to see the, the rate of rotation. If you... 
and with that you can infer that it has gone through. Yeah, okay. Exactly. Right. And the second question was, but it was a different image, was uh, I think before this, where you showed this star also rotating around the black hole, I think it was. It's the same. Yeah. It's, it's a model of the, of the data. Right. So does the black hole also, also generate a magnetic field? And why is it then the star not going into the black Straight hole? In. Yes. <laughs> um, why does it make it actually this elliptic so rotation? If, if we had been in the situation, if I just... So, if this is our star, um, it has it, its own initial velocity. And if the star was initially moving towards the black hole, it would just go straight in. Um, or, well, it would crash. Um, but because it has some initial velocity in this direction, the force just causes it to change slightly. Now, over a very, very long period of time, it will lose energy and spiral in towards the, the central source, um, but that's a, a longer period. Yeah. I had a third, but I forgot now. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So, there's one on this side, yeah? Yeah, there's any Thank you for the talk. So, uh, if I understood correctly, the aim of the experiments you're performing is to figure out which the origin of the magnetic fields are. So my question is, uh, what are the different implications between the two scenarios you, you try to figure out? Like between the early stage magnetic fields and the later stage magnetic fields. So the implications for the structure, sorry, the implications for the structure around us, it wouldn't change anything. So it's, it's purely to know. Okay. Is, the, is the answer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think there's a question over here. In the first row. Make me the microphone. If the keel scrapen. There are, in the Karoo Desert, uh, if I r remember correctly, uh, 64 uh, dishes at a certain time from now. Uh, but is that only a financial reason because of the, the number, or uh, is it scientifically uh, to explain uh, by um, to to achieve more uh, results at the end? No, it was um, so it was purely a way of building up the project. So the aim is to so the, in 2024 there will be 197 dishes, and 64 of those will come from the Meerkat telescope. The Meerkat telescope itself is being constructed as a, as a prototype. So it's part of the design process for the full telescope. And originally, the idea was to have Meerkat and SKA-1. Um, but then, uh, financially, it doesn't make sense to have them separately. So the 64 Meerkat dishes were absorbed into the 197, um, which is a sensible thing to do. Um, but yeah, it was part of the technical development of the telescope. There was, in fact, um, another telescope on site originally that was the first technical pathfinder, which was called the CAT-7 telescope, which was seven dishes. So you can think of it as a, um, a stepwise process. So it went from seven dishes to 64 to 197. Okay, thank you. Any more? Oh, yeah, we have one more here. Can you just wait for the microphone so the people behind you can hear? Thank you. Uh, what does the magnetic field of our planet uh, do to your uh, observations? Does it di disturb you? Yes, it messes them up, <laughs> is, is, is the short answer. Um, yeah, so the Earth's, the Earth's mag it's not the magnetic field that's really the problem. The Earth's magnetic field changes very slowly, so we understand it really very well. The problem is how many electrons there are in any given place at any given time. And that's something that doesn't stay constant. So it changes, there's a day and night cycle. Um, the other thing that affects it significantly is solar activity. When the sun flares, it releases energy that ionizes the gas in our own atmosphere, and that produces more rotation. And it can cause, set up, you can think of the atmosphere as a giant bubble of gas around the Earth. And when you hit it with a solar flare, it sets up waves and ripples and turbulence, and it's 
um, and it destroys your polarization observations. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's all very challenging. Um, is there any final questions, any burning questions that people want to ask? Oh, yeah, there is. Just behind you. Yeah. Thank you for your talk, firstly. Uh, my question is, is it possible to big giant uh, polarization source can eat their effect and we cannot see them? Or this is just the imagination of my science fiction. <laughs> sorry, so, so you're asking, is it possible that there's a, a giant, sorry, so can you ask the question again? Of course. Uh, is it possible, I mean, on our direction, uh, there really there are two giant big uh, black holes or blazer, whatever it was. They can just block themselves or neutralize their effect and we cannot see them. Hmm. Um, so, so uh, so yes, in some ways. So the, the polarization that we see, when we look at the sky, we have a finite resolution on the sky. So if we have two polarizations with opposite directions within a single resolution element, they cancel out. Um, it's called beam depolarization. So yes, if two sources were close enough together, um, they could cancel out each other's polarization or observed polarization. That's a very nice question. Okay. Well, if there's if there's no oh we do have one last one over here. I think you had the first one as well, didn't you? It's in the it's, it's behind there. Thanks for uh, the poster that you showed for, for this uh, talk had that beautiful structure mm. of you could almost see the magnetic field at work, but. You didn't show that picture, did you? So not that exact picture, because I, my picture wasn't high enough resolution for the picture, for the poster. Um, where's it gone? <laughs> but was that an observation or a simulation? So that was, I think, a Planck map. Is that right? Yes. But it's very similar to, if I can find it. <laughs> um, I showed my, uh, this one. Oh, yeah. Okay. So this is essentially showing you the same thing. The difference with my image is that the resolution here is higher. This is a better map. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, the resolution wasn't quite high enough for us to, to reproduce it in its glory. Um, okay, well, let's, uh, let's thank Anna again for, for her lecture. And as, as I said, it, the, she's here as the, the Blau Chair at the University of Groningen. It's a real honour to have her here for, for the, uh, the next month and I think some period uh, next year as well. Um, also, to show our appreciation, we've, uh, we've got a couple of gifts for Anna for uh, the talk that she's given. Uh, the first one is uh, it's a book called The Discovery of Heaven uh, by Harry Mullish, which is a famous Dutch book which has been translated into English. Um, it is... Uh, it is essentially partly, I believe, set in Astron, uh, <laughs> and uh, there's apparently characters within this book that you may recognise, and I, I can't wait to read it myself, actually, after I was told that earlier today. <laughs> so this is the first book. Thank you very much. And um, the second book we have is a book on uh, Cap Tyne, uh, who is uh, uh, essentially the person that we, that our institute in here in Groningen is named after. This book uh, was written by uh, Peter van der Kraut, who was uh, uh, once a dean at the, at, the, at the university here and the director of our institute. I don't think he's here today, unfortunately. But we have his, uh, his book, which is, is on uh, uh, cap time. And we'd like to give this to you also to remember your, your time here in Groningen. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, so that concludes our lecture. Thank you very much for coming. Um, it was great to see so many people here, and I hope you find the, the lecture very interesting. So, goodbye.